Today I'd like to share my testimony with you. I think there are some lessons that can be drawn from it that apply to praying for people for their salvation. As I travel around and teach and talk to people, this is one of the main concerns of many, many Christians. Um, praying for family members, close friends, and nothing seems to happen. Nothing seems to move. So what, what are some effective ways to pray for people? So we'll get into that after I share some of the events. Um, I was raised in a God-fearing Protestant family. My parents both had a lot of integrity, very hard-working, uh, raised us that way as well, valued education very highly, um, I think both my mother and father were the first children in their family unit to get a full bachelor's degree. And my dad went on and got a master's right away. So it was just expected that we would go to university and that we would work hard in school. Well, I had an advantage and a problem. One advantage is that my mother taught me to read at age two and a half because she already had one kid younger than I was and another one on the way. So she kind of taught me to read in self-defense, I think. And she was a school teacher and, and loved teaching kids to read. So I learned how to read very early and got to be good at it and uh, had good retention even though I read very fast. The problem with that advantage was that uh, I was able to get through all of primary and secondary school without ever having to study. I didn't get top grades, but I got good grades. And the other thing that happened was that I skipped first grade because I had already was already reading so well. Um, we moved to Texas, and the school superintendent found out through my Sunday school teacher that I could already read. And he said, well, let's put you in second grade. You can skip first grade. You're not going to learn anything there. So they put me into second grade, which made me one of the youngest in the class. And that was not to my advantage. So I was uh, intellectually advanced more than the other kids, but socially kind of backward. Because my father was in the Air Force, we moved around a lot. And never really formed long-term friendships. We moved house three times every two years. So when people say to me, the peop that YWAM is always changing, I'm thinking, you don't know anything about military life. <laughs> or even the business world. A lot of people in the business world get moved around a lot, a lot, much more than we do in YWAM. Anyway, <coughs> So I grew up as a teenager in the 60s. In the 60s, we were all practic practicing existentialists. Most of us didn't know what that meant, actually, but um, we, were, we were doing it. We were practicing. Existentialism was the, the parent of um, postmodernity. And we were, it was a philosophy that came out of Paris and Berlin pre-war, but was, came into the whole culture into my generation specifically in the 60s. That's what the 60s revolution was all about, really, was um, the living out of the ex existentialist teaching that your, your finding truth depends on a defining experience. So if you're searching for truth, meaning in life, et cetera, et cetera, you will find that through your experience. But it's only going to be yours. It's not going to be others. And just because you find it in one way doesn't mean that anyone else can find it in your way. They've got to seek and find their own way. So um, this is what everyone was doing. And you could see it on the, on the jackets of books. The, uh, the authors that sold the most books, they, they told in the bo on the book jacket um, everything the author had done, all their different experiences, their very different jobs. That was supposed to make them cool and, and make reading them worthwhile. Also in the 60s, along with this, um, a lot of new experiences were proposed 
there in the youth culture, um, such as the sexual revolution, the drug revolution. We had a Harvard professor telling us to uh, tune in, turn on, and drop out and use LSD. And if a Harvard professor says it, it's got to be true, right? And the Eastern religions. So all that had been around in, in different American subcultures for, for generations, like the jazz subculture, for example. But this is the first time in the 60s that it went through the whole, the whole nation, from the West Coast to the East, and then became a, a way of life for all of us who were, who were my age. I'm one of the older ones of that generation. That was the, my little brothers and sister who were part of it as well. So I went away to university a year too early because of having skipped that first grade. My father told me I should, I should learn a trade or something before going to university. And he was right, of course, but I was 17 and, and not about listening to my father at that time. So I went to university, it, and I had a lot of experiences that first year. And, and one thing I did not experience was studying which led me to another experience, though, which was being kicked out of school. So I received a polite letter asking me not to return because of my very bad grade. So I went back home to Illinois. This first school was in Wisconsin. And I went back home and, and worked in a factory for a while, saved some money, and re-enrolled in archaeology classes especially. And then, um, there, but there again wasn't studying. And as I look back now, I'm pretty sure I was in depression. Back in the 60s, nobody knew much about depression. We didn't talk about it. And it wouldn't have been diagnosed by anyone I knew of. Um, but that was what was happening. And I found out later it was hereditary in my family. So I'm pretty sure that was what was going on. But... Um, that led to be my being kicked out of that university as well. Even though I had good times in my archaeology classes, went on a dig in the summer of 67 and got to dig in a 1,000-year-old garbage pit. And I can confirm that after a 1,000 years, garbage still smells bad. Because, of course, it had been sealed in an anaerobic environment without oxygen. And we had to dig through that stuff. It, but it was very interesting. It was a good summer. But still, it didn't, it didn't help me enough to be able to study and, and uh, keep going in university. So that second time I was kicked out, I ended up in the Army, the U.S. Army, because back then, in about, that was about 68, I think, back then, every American male had to go into the military. It was during the Vietnam War. There were only three exceptions. If you were the father of a child, if you were the only surviving son of your family, because the other ones had been killed in, in the war, or if you were enrolled in a university. And if you were not in one of those three categories, you were in the Army. And after eight weeks basic training, they put you in infantry training, and right after infantry, infantry training, sent you to fight in the jungles of Vietnam. So I decided I didn't want to do infantry in the jungle, but um, I did realize that I could get language training if I signed up for an extra year in the Army. They would train me in a different language. And I really wanted to learn an Asian language. And I thought with the war in Vietnam, there was a good chance they'd teach me an Asian language. So I enrolled for an extra year in the Army and took the, the language aptitude test. Scored pretty highly on it, I guess. And at the end of my basic training, applied to study French. Now, I had all this worked out because I wanted to learn an Asian language, but I didn't want to put that on my application because the Army never gives you what you ask for. Never. It's like uh, a sure thing they will not give you what you ask for. So I asked for French because I didn't want French. I'd already had years of French. I'd had French in middle school and all through high school and all through university without ever trying to get into French. 
just kind of happened to me. Other people made decisions that put me in French classes. I tried to get out of it in university because I'd met the university language requirement, but my advisor wouldn't let me. So I even took it at advanced French in, in university. Um, but when the results came back, the company clerk came and found me and he said, Bloomer, I don't know what you did, but you're the only one out of a hundred men who got what he asked for. I said, what do you mean? He said, they put you into French classes. So looking back now, I see it was the sovereignty of God in helping me to prepare to be a missionary to French Europe. <laughs> back then I was pretty unhappy until I figured out, I learned that the language school for French was in Monterey, California. <coughs> it was the summer, uh, it was... 1968, and the dream of every Midwestern guy was to go to California and meet a California girl. So here the Army was paying my way, and the Presidio, the base in Monterey, is one of the most beautiful in the world. It's on a hill overlooking that bay. And it was totally easy for me because I'd had years of French. All I had to do was memorize some military vocabulary, and I coasted through six months of language training. Um, met a California girl. My army buddies introduced me to marijuana, which we would smoke sitting on the roof of the barracks because you could smoke up there. And even if somebody came up the ladder to get you, you could throw the smoke away. The smoke would be blown away by the breeze off the ocean and you could throw the cigarette over the edge and you'd be safe. So I coasted through those months and they sent me after that to Thailand, where it was another place full of experiences. The marijuana was cheaper than cigarettes. The alcohol was cheaper than Coca-Cola. Um, I, I became a practicing Buddhist. I had studied uh, in university and studied anthropology and archaeology, so I was very interested in the culture and, and getting to know the culture, which is why I became a practicing Buddhist really, is to, to participate in cultural activities like that. But I was on a spiritual search. I, was, I looked into other things during that time. I looked into uh, Rosicrucianism. I found a book in the Army Library written by a French priest called Yoga for Christians. I got into some, uh, uh, got into yoga that way and was really searching I remember one thing that happened that, that kind of shook me up, actually. Um, I had friends who had motorcycles. I didn't want to ride a motorcycle in Thailand because I wanted to live. They basically had death wishes, all of them, because they had been in Vietnam and were fully looking to die by age 30. And so they were perfectly happy to ride motorcycles around Bangkok. But I would at least ride with them. I got on behind them and, and rode. And we would go to different tourist sites on the weekends when we could. And we went to one place. It was a, the Temple of the, of the Black Buddha. And it was one of the biggest Buddhas in Thailand, made out of uh, black granite. Very famous in Thailand. So um, we went there one weekend. And I still remember with utmost clarity walking into that temple. Now we'd been in a lot of Buddhist temples over over those months. I was in Thailand two and a half years, so we had a lot of time to get around. But as I walked into this one, it's dark in there. There's the, the only light is, is candles inside, besides the light from the doorway. So I'm walking in the doorway, the light's behind me, and I, I wait a moment for my eyes to get used to the the low level of light, and I'm looking up and I see a huge toe. And I realize then that the toe is attached to a foot, and I look up, and there's a knee above the foot, and it's the knee of the Buddha who's seated in the, the lotus position. You know how Buddhists, how Buddhists are normally seated, especially in Thailand. So I I kept looking up and I see his two knees and then this huge torso, several stories high, like just the torso was three or four stories high. 
And then on up above that, there's this massive head. And the eyes are looking straight at me. And in that moment, I know I'm not just looking at a statue. There is a spirit looking at me through the eyes of that statue. And I had no expectation of this. I had no place for it in my worldview. But I knew not only that it was a spirit, but that it was unspeakably evil. It was evil in a way that I had never contemplated. And I had read a lot about World War II and the Holocaust and everything because my dad was in the army in World War II and involved in the liberation of one of the camps. And so I was, and then we moved to Europe when I was a teenager, a young teenager. We spent three and a half years in England and traveled all over France and Germany especially. So I was, I had read about that episode of human evil, read my dad's history books. But, but seeing that being looking at me from clear up there, and what struck me the most was the absolute indifference, the cold indifference of the evil incarnated in that being. And I was in shock. Nothing in my Presbyterian church had prepared me for this kind of experience. And all I could do was just turn around very carefully and very slowly and walk out of there. Uh, scared to death, but knowing that what I, that indifference that I had felt meant that that being was not interested in me at all. I was less than an ant to that being. And I realize now it was because I was not saved and I, I was uh, no threat to that being at all at that point and therefore of no interest. So I was safe. But I just, I just kind of had to park that experience away on a shelf because I had no place for it in my worldview. I had, I had turned away from the God of my um, family, <coughs> the God of my youth. I mean, we were in church almost every Sunday. We heard a lot of sermons. We talk about them over Sunday dinner. Um, so... But I had come to the place of rejecting that God basically as an excuse to do what I wanted to and run from one experience to another, which is why most people respect God. It's because if they admitted that he existed, they would admit that what he said is right and they would have to change their lifestyle. Well, they don't want to do that, so they call God's very existence into doubt. So anyway, that was a pretty important experience for me. But then there was this girl who's, who was writing me the whole time. And she was a girl from back home in my Presbyterian church. I had actually taught Sunday school with her. We were wanting to serve in some way, and, uh, and um, nobody else wanted the seventh graders, the 12-year-olds because they were so difficult to handle. So we said, well, we'll take them. So they had us teach them the 12-year-olds for one, I forget if it was a summer or what. I think it must have been a summer. Anyway, we did that together. We were good friends. And she, after university, went out to California to be a school teacher. And then she writes me this letter saying, uh, I've I've become a Christian. I'm thinking, what do you mean you've become a Christian? You've been in the Presbyterian church your whole life. And she goes on to explain that she's met Jesus personally, and she encloses all these magazine articles of this Jesus movement sweeping California, and famous picture from Life magazine of hundreds or even a couple thousand young people getting baptized in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean in so off Southern California. So she says, read these articles, please. we got to talk. I'm going to explain what happened. And I thought this was the weirdest thing, that this banker's daughter could all of a sudden decide to go weird 
with uh, some kind of experience with Jesus. And she was obviously mentally unhinged, probably from living in California. Anyway, I, at first I didn't pay much attention, and I, I argued with her. I wrote back and said, this is really wrong. This is why God doesn't exist. And we kind of agreed to disagree, but she kept praying for me and kept writing to me. And finally, when I got out of the Army, I was, I was a mess. After three and a half years in the Army, two and a half years of that spent in Thailand into heavy marijuana use, I was going back into depression. And I realized I needed to get out of Thailand. So I, I got an early release from my four-year commitment. I got out uh, over five months early, which I realize now is the Lord springing me from that trap. And she invited me to come and see her on the way home. So the Army flew me back to Oakland in Northern California, and I took a flight down to Southern California. She met me there for a weekend. And it was an amazing time. She introduced me to her roommates, who were also Christians. She took me to her church on the Sunday morning. And that, was, that just blew me away. It was a, a bunch of people in an elementary classroom in a, that they were renting on Sunday mornings. And they were sitting around in school chairs and, and singing these songs. Um, and people were playing guitars. And I thought, oh, I've never seen anything like this. And there was such an atmosphere. I'm pretty sure that if, you know, if I'd stayed another week right there, I'd have, I'd have gotten saved on the spot. But I had to get back home. I needed to get ready for school starting. I had re-enrolled in the university. Again, my third try to try to finish this time. And I wanted to reconnect with my family. America had changed in the two and a half years I had gone. It was a different place. I came back. I was in culture shock, like many veterans are. I had not visited the whole time. I'd only done a bit of tourism around Malaysia and Singapore, but not left Southeast Asia during that two and a half years. So I came back, got into my classes, and at first I was very happy because I was out of the Army. I didn't have to wear green clothes all day anymore. I didn't have to cut my hair. I immediately started growing my hair long again. And uh, the worst injustice in my Army was that they made me cut off the corners of my mustache right here. So I was free from all that. I could grow my mustache as well as my hair. And um, thought, well, all my troubles are over because I'm out of the Army. But then realized over just a couple weeks in September, early October of 1971, that my problems were following me around. They were in me, and I could not blame the Army because here I was out of the army, and my same depression was coming back. So this time I really did not know what to do. I had tried everything there was to try. Um, really, the only thing left for me was suicide. I had not gotten to the point of thinking seriously about that, but I knew it, the thought was there. And other members of my family had done that, s which I didn't know at the time, but it was, it would have been a very real possibility. So anyway, I'm seeking still. I spend time in the university bookshop reading the Tolkien trilogy, for example. It had just come out, if I remember right, it, it was the bestseller on all the university campuses, Lord of the Rings. And I was reading through that, and, and some of the points that he makes uh, really struck me, such as absolute good and absolute evil being in conflict. And I remembered that experience in that temple with the Black Buddha. And, and things like nothing ever happens by chance, and, and all these kind of principles that he brings out in his books were, were sinking deep. And I, I tried in my Presbyterian church, really, to give my life to God. The pastor, one Sunday, he did something I didn't remember him ever doing before. He said, if you want to really give your life to God, just 
just, uh, he was praying, we were standing because he was praying at the end of his sermon. And he said, um, if you want to give your life to God, remain standing and I will pray a prayer for you. So I remained standing because it was, a, for one thing, a easier to remain standing than sit down. Very few people sat down. <laughs> anyway, he prayed this prayer and nothing happened. So I thought, well, that didn't work. But it planted a thought that maybe I should give myself to God. And my thinking at the time was kind of like this. I've done everything wrong. I've broken all the commandments. I deserve to be punished. And my punishment it is that I'm going to become a Christian. And I, but I deserve it because I deserve to be punished. And my only hope was that God wouldn't make me a pastor or a missionary, which is what my grandmother always said I should do. I always said, no, no, grandmother, I couldn't do that. I don't have the patience. Anyway. The, uh, one of the other people praying for me daily was also part of the church. And there were a bunch of the girls of this church, of our former youth group and their sisters, had... Um, had gotten saved, really saved, and, but none of the guys around them had gotten saved, which is often the case. So they were praying for guys to get saved, and I was one of the ones on their list because I'd been active in the youth group and, and that kind of stuff. So they were praying for me, and one of these girls is um, in charge of the InterVarsity book table every noontime, in the student union building. This is a huge building that has all kinds of facilities for students. Not the library, but a bookstore and game rooms and lounges and study places. And, and it's a general hangout place for students. And there were 30,000 students on that campus, so there's always a lot of coming and going. And in the lobby, they had a places where student organizations could sell books and hand out brochures and stuff and she was there with the Christian union people selling Christian books in her varsity and I would go talk to her every chance I got because she was one of the only people I knew on the campus and certainly the only one who would smile at me because back then campuses were very serious because it was the Vietnam War protesting Richard Nixon all this stuff and uh, it was not cool to go around uh, smiling at people. But anyway, she was very nice to me, and I, I loved to go talk to her, but she had this weird sign on her table. It said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I would read that every day and think, what in the world does that mean? I, it just did not, it just did not penetrate my understanding. Anyway, she invited me one day to, to come and hear uh, a speaker they were inviting. His name was Arthur Katz, and she said, he's a Messianic Jew. I said, well, what's that? She said, a Jew who follows Jesus, who believes Jesus is the Messiah. And I thought this was very strange, because I had Jewish friends in high school, and I knew that there's one name they could not stand, and that was the name of Jesus. So to hear there was a Jew who was following Jesus was, was pretty interesting. And I was so desperate, I said, I agreed to come. So I showed up at the meeting he was having in the early afternoon, right there in the student union building on campus, which certainly would not be allowed today. And I'm sitting at the back of the room on the floor, because there are no more chairs, and leaning against a pillar, and this guy shares his testimony. And he shares about what his life was like before he met Jesus. And he'd been a, a teacher in Berkeley. And he shared about his searching through Oriental religions and, and all. It sounded like my life when he was talking. And he said, that was when I was in the kingdom of darkness, but now I'm in the kingdom of light, and this is what my life is like. And he talked about just being in the, in the love of God and the joy and the peace. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what I want. And then he said something that really struck me. He said, there are only two kingdoms. 
There's only light and darkness. There aren't three kingdoms. There aren't 36 kingdoms. There aren't dozens of kingdoms. There are only two. And if you're not in one, then by definition, you are in the other. And this shook me because growing up in the Presbyterian church, we'd heard about the kingdoms, but we kind of always assumed there was this middle kingdom of twilight because the kingdom of darkness was for really bad people like Hitler. The kingdom of light was for really good people like missionaries and pastors. Well, some pastors anyway. But then there was this middle ground where most of us normal people were. And we were trying to do good most of the time when we'd give our $5 in church on Sunday. And, and uh, we were just hoping to kind of do okay so that we would have 50%, 51% good, good works and show up before God in, in the judgment throne and be led into heaven, kind of squeak into heaven that way which no one ever actually said, but that's kind of what we believe. So to hear this guy say with, the, with this authority, there are only two kingdoms, and, and if you're not in one, you're, you're in the other. I'm thinking, well, I'm certainly not in that kingdom of, of light. And then he said something else. He said, if, if you're in the kingdom of darkness, then your father is Satan. And I thought, whoa, that would explain several things that happened over these last years. And then that got a reaction from the university students who were there. A lot of the, the Jewish people had come out, the Jewish guys from the Jewish fraternities, just because they heard this was a Messianic Jew and they hated that. So they came out to dis disturb his, his message and make trouble. And they just verbally attacked him right then. And he... He just responded in the opposite spirit. And I knew I was seeing a demonstration of darkness and light right there. And he said, uh, after a few minutes of being insulted, he said, uh, please, I'm just going to pray right now. And they respected that. I'm not sure they would nowadays either. But in that moment, they did. And he said, I'm going to pray a little prayer, and you pray with me if you want to give your life to God. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll try this again, not expecting anything to happen. So I prayed that little prayer with them. It was quite short and quite insignificant, really. No deep theology. But what had changed, apparently, was my heart. Because when I prayed that prayer, sitting there on the floor in that uni university hall, I had a, an incredible conversion experience. I, I first felt something crawl up my spine and leave through the top of my head. I had no idea what that was. And then I felt like a huge weight had lifted from my shoulders. I mean, I used to lift weights, you know, and you put this weight on your shoulders and you squat down with it and then you stand up with the weight still on your shoulders. And after you do some of those, you put the weight back on the weight rack and you get rid of that weight and this is what that felt like like i'd been carrying a huge weight on my shoulders for a long time and i didn't know it was there until it left and that weight left me and i felt so light i uh, i stood up as people were starting to leave and move around I stood up and I had to look down at my feet to make sure they were touching the floor because it felt like I was, I was walking several centimeters off the floor. And then I realized that I, my face was hurting, my face muscles, because I was smiling. And I had no idea why I was smiling. I had no idea what I should be happy about because I had just given my life to God, right? It was very serious. In the Presbyterian Church, they never talked about the joy of the Lord. Um, that, that just was not part of our religious experience. So I had no idea why I should be smiling and why I was so light. And I kept repeating to myself, it'll go away. This will go away. Because that's what happened with my other ex spiritual experiences in the past years. They hadn't proved that lasting. I'd experienced something 
uh, but then it would it would go away. But it, the smiling thing really bothered me because um, people were looking at me like, "What is it wrong with this person?" Because here I am at this university campus with this big goofy grin on my on my face, and I'm worried that people will think I'm stupid or hoping they'd think I was just high on drugs or something. Anyway, I went back to the book table. My friend wasn't there, it was someone else, but I got some books by Francis Schaeffer and C.S. Lewis and and read through those very quickly and and figured out what had happened to me. And uh, I didn't realize how deep the change was until a few weeks later when the, a cousin of mine came back to visit. He had seen me right after I was out of the army and then gone away for a few weeks and come back. And he took one look at me and he said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean? He said, your face has changed. You're completely different. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the joy you have. Where did you get that joy? So I realized that my life had changed. And I was uh, able to continue that, that quarter. And even though I was going to <coughs> Jesus people meetings uh, a lot of the time and Bible studies and prayer meetings and all that kind of stuff, I was able to study enough and get good grades. And then the final term actually is when I got straight A's which I thought would make my father happy, but actually it made him furious. He said, you're getting straight A's in your last term of four years of university? He said, you could have done this all along. And I didn't say anything, but I knew very well I couldn't have done it all along. <laughs> I was only doing it because I'd given my life to the Lord and he's putting it back together. I'd like to say just a, f a few things about praying for people to to get converted, to come to God. Um, sometimes we pray as if we think that God doesn't love the people we're praying for. We pray things like, oh Lord, please save my sister, please save my cousin. We don't have to convince him to love them. And he's already doing as much as he can given the ways he has chosen to limit himself to save those people. By this I mean he created each of us with a free will and he's not going to drag anyone kicking and screaming into heaven who doesn't want to be there. It's our choice. We're created in the image and likeness of God and our choices are so important to him that he respects them for eternity. So it has to be a, a voluntary thing. Someone has to choose to come with him. Otherwise, it's not love. And we cannot expect God to, to force people to come and, and live with him and follow him. He does not do that. So we shouldn't pray as if we think he does. What what people need is a sense of a sense of their desperate need for god this is going to motivate them to move to move away from from their comfortable life in other words we can pray that their life would be uncomfortable my dear mother asked me one time she said uh, Pray for your sister. She's just miserable. And I said, okay, Mom, I'll pray for her. I do pray for her, but I'll pray for her. And then I, a couple minutes later, I thought, wait a minute. I'm not praying for my sister to be happy because she's running from God. And I know she's running from God. <laughs> We've talked about it. And I'm not going to pray that she be happy in her rebellion. But Oftentimes, the people we love, we're so close to, we want them to be happy. We want good things to happen to them. But as long as good things keep happening to them, why should they turn to God? Now, one very important factor in my conversion that I didn't mention was that I met a lady. I was trying to go out with her daughter while I was um, in language training in Monterey. 
And we met these girls and went out with them a couple times, a friend of mine and I. And this, I met this lady's mother. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was a committed Christian. And she decided, I'm, I'm sure she was led by God, meeting me one time, she said, the Lord could use a young man like that in his kingdom. I'm going to pray for him. And she prayed for me every day for two and a half years. And I'm sure it was her prayers that, that tenderized my heart, that opened me up to the place where I was more seriously searching at the end of my army time. So we need to be praying for people, that's for sure, because the difference between someone who gets converted and does not is prayer. Someone's prayed for that person to be converted. And oftentimes there are not enough people praying for the ones who are not converted. When we were living in England, three of us U.S. Air Force families lived on one block in a suburb of London. In later years, I was with YWAM, another girl ended up with YWAM, and another girl from the third family ended up in Campus Crusade. There were three full-time workers out of those three families on that one block in, in Pinner, the suburb of London. How did that happen? I am sure there was an intercessor watching us go to get the school bus, watching us walk home from the school bus, prayed for us every day during that school year that we were there. That's the only answer to why three kids from three different families who were not committed Christians, none of the three families. We went to church. The other two, maybe one of them went to church, but one of them did not for sure go to church. The only answer is prayer. And I know I will meet that intercessor in heaven. Prayer makes a huge difference. But we have to pray in ways that are biblical. And, and trying to beg God to save someone we love is just not biblical. I think a far better way to pray is that the idols in that person's life would be torn down. And we have authority. If we have been given a prayer assignment for someone, we have authority to, to tear their idols down in the spirit. But it's going to hurt. It may mean them losing their job. It may mean them losing their house. It may mean them getting a terrible sickness. Um, and it's what I call the Jonah prayer. And I teach this when I do teachings for parents of prodigal children because my son was a prodigal for seven years. And I realized pretty quickly that um, Cynthia and I needed to pray for him the Jonah prayer, which is, Lord, send a great fish and swallow him. Now, sometimes people bring up Jonah as an example of the Lord forcing someone into a relationship with him. Well, that didn't happen with Jonah. If you read the story, he was swallowed by a great fish knocked overboard by a storm, then swallowed by a fish, but he spent three days in the stomach of that fish deciding whether he was going to follow God or not. Three days. And finally decided. But it was his choice. But I challenge parents with this. Are you ready to pray <coughs> that the Lord will, s will send your child to a very difficult place? A place where there's only him to turn to. I would ask Cynthia that regularly for years. And she was not. <coughs> she was not ready. It was too much for her mother's heart to think of her son being in that difficult position. But I tell parents, you have to get beyond the place where when your rebellious kid goes out for the weekend, you're praying that the police don't catch him and put him into prison. You have to get to the place where you're praying that the police do catch him and put him into prison for as long as it takes for him to get saved. That's love. That's desiring the highest good for someone. So I think the most effective way to pray, and it was certainly the case in my life, I came to the point where all my idols were gone. My self-sufficiency was gone. <clears throat> my academic success was completely gone. 
My idea that I could make some of my own life in any single area was gone. I knew I was naked before God and could do nothing about my life. And I think that's where most people have to come to be before they can get saved. So I just want to encourage you, um, pray that their idols would be come down, would come down, but be there for them when they do. And that's hard to go through, hard to live with. But if we're really serious about the salvation of those we love, that's the kind of prayer that we will pray. It's what worked in my life.